Good morning and welcome to Sycamore Creek Church. My name is Kevin. I am the worship leader and I'm um, really glad that you're here with us this morning virtually for our worship service. Um, we're going to start things off with a time of song. We're going to sing a, a real old one, How Great Thou Art, and then a new one called Rescue Art after that.
breeze all around me Hems me in on every side But I will wait for you All of my days It's in your strength That I abide You lift me up Up above the raging sea You're my rescuer Your mighty hand reaches out Grace and peace be with you. Good morning. My name is Mark. I'm the pastor at Sycamore Creek in Potterville. Welcome to our online worship service. I am actually here today in the sanctuary in Potterville recording this. I'm so glad that you are with us today for worship. At this point in the service, I would ask that you would get your candle out. Wherever your candle might be, grab that candle and get ready to light it. We light that each week as a reminder of Christ's presence with us as we worship. I've got my candle here, and I'm going to get it lit. Have that candle and have it set out. As you worship today, as a reminder of God's love, as a reminder of Christ's presence with you as you worship. As we look to Christ and we look to Christ's presence among us as we worship, I'm going to invite you to pray with me. And as we get ready to pray, pray, a reminder that you can share prayer requests or praises with a team of people who would love to pray for you. Just email prayers at sycamorecreekchurch.org with your prayer request or praise. And we have a team of people who would love to pray for those things. As we get ready to pray, we're wrapping up our series today. I think you're wrong, but I'm listening and it's a series where we're hoping to have graceful political conversations, and that's something that we cannot do without God working in and through us. And today what we're going to be talking about is real progress, actually making a difference through these graceful political conversations. I invite you to pray with me as we pray that God would help us to make a difference through his grace at work in us. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your love and for your grace shown through Jesus Christ. God, we look to you today as we look at our candle, as we look at the light 
of you shining in the world. We pray, God, that you would help us to be your light shining in the world, that we would reflect your love, that we would reflect your grace and share it with others. God, our, our political situation in the United States is so divided. We pray, God, that, that you would help bring us together. We pray that that would start with our church, that that would extend to our community, and that eventually through you, we might be one. Not because we're all the same, not because we all agree, but because, God, we are focused on you and on your love. Help us to live out your love in our own lives and help us to share that love with others. God, we come to you today. We come to you from very different places. We come to you with health issues. We come to you with relationship concerns. We come to you with financial concerns. We come to you anxious, uncertain, fearful, cautious. God, we pray that we would give all of these things to you and that in you we would find hope and strength and courage. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. I invite you to continue praying with me as you join me in praying the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught us. Will you pray that with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Here are our hosts for this morning. Hi, I'm Joanna. Who are you? Hi, I'm Mila. And this is uh, Mila's Bunny Beast. And we want to welcome you to Sycamore Creek for our online uh, service today. During our service, Pastor Mark's going to put a link in for our, our digital connection card. So be sure to fill that out and share your next steps with us. While service is going, we'd love for you to chat and comment in our worship service chat room there and uh, share what you're thinking and interact with other people. Don't forget to invite people to come and share worship with us by creating a watch party and sharing the link on your Facebook page. And of course, check in on social media with the use of hashtag couch church. Today's message begins with this. I've been driving around Powderville and I have been paying attention to yard signs. Uh, yard signs are everywhere this time of year, aren't they? Uh, there's all sorts of different signs. I, I see some signs that are just more generic get out and vote type signs. Uh, signs for Republicans, signs for Democrat. I'm just driving by a sign that says, choose kindness. There's all these signs and, and I got to thinking about these yard signs that people put out. And, you know, you'll drive by some signs and uh, a whole yard will be filled with Biden and every other candidate from the Democratic Party that this household supports. And then you'll drive by another house, sometimes right next door, and it's got a Trump sign and every other candidate from the Republican Party. And as I think about those signs, I, I'm curious, do neighbors talk to each other? about those political signs? My guess is probably not. I always wonder if putting out a sign like that helps you get along with your neighbor or not. Do neighbors talk about that or do they avoid politics like most of us do? I think if we're really honest, what we want is we want real progress. We, we, we want to get along. It's not, it's not that we enjoy conflicts necessarily. If you do, we might have to have another talk. Uh, but I think we want something more. And it's that something more that we, we've been really talking about throughout this series. I think you're wrong, but I'm listening. Uh, we have a lofty goal that we've, we've set up in this series. And, and that lofty goal is, is based on the quote that we started with this, from this series from the founder of the Methodist movement, John Wesley. Uh, John Wesley wrote in one of his sermons, and we cannot think alike. May we not love alike? May we not be of one heart, though we are not of one opinion? Without all doubt, 
we may. Here in all the children of God may unite, notwithstanding these smaller differences. I love that quote. Oh, we've come together during this series and been reminded that it's the, the thing that's first in importance, it's not a political party. It's not. It's our love of Jesus and our desire to share God's love with the world. And therefore, we started this series by focusing on ourselves and, and accepting God's grace and love in us so that we might have grace-filled political conversations. Last week, we continued and we talked about loving one another and how difficult that is when it comes to political disagreement. It's tough to love someone else, especially when we disagree. As we wrap up this series, again, we've acknowledged again and again throughout this series, this is a tough topic to talk about. Our goal, our, our goal of grace-filled conversation, it's a big, difficult goal to live out. But I think the grace of God is big enough for it. I think the grace of God is big enough for us to have grace-filled political conversations. An inspiration throughout this series has been a book by two women, Sarah Stewart Holland and Beth Silvers, called I Think You're Wrong but I'm listening. Sarah and Beth come from different political perspectives, and yet they've been modeling how to have grace-filled conversations uh, through their Pantsuits Politics podcast and through what they've written in this book. I think you're wrong, but I'm listening. We're going to talk today about how to have difficult conversations, not just for the conversation, but for the hope of real progress. I think we're ready for that. We've been talking about this for this is our third week. We're ready for real progress. Often it feels like we're stuck. And today what I want to do is I want to give us some practical, biblical information that can help us to have difficult conversations and move toward real progress. The first suggestion that I have uh, to get to have conversations that move us toward real progress is to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And nothing about what we're doing with each other in conversation or what we're asking others to do is easy. It's not. We have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. That's a tall order because well, here's the problem. All too often our, uh, our political engagement looks like a lot of, like what we put in our bodies for our food. Uh, we love comfort food and, and that's often how we approach politics. We like macaroni and cheese, and we love the macaroni and cheese of hearing someone else parrot our frustration. You know, we love pizza, and we love the mocking of putting down people that we disagree with. How can they be so stupid? Uh, we love the milkshake of headlines and social media posts that confirm our suspicions. I knew I was right. We love comfort food, but what we really need are our vegetables. Just like my mom used to tell me, we need to eat our vegetables. I'm going to challenge us today to put aside our instincts, to repeat a burn, to put down the other side, and to get all outraged at what someone else thinks. But instead to do the nourishing, difficult work of eating our vegetables. That's right, eating our vegetables. You see, eating our vegetables involves exposing ourselves to new and contrary perspectives. We need to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Sarah and Beth put it this way. They, they say that somewhere along the way we decided as a country that we don't want to be uncomfortable at any time for any reason. <laughs> that sounds true, doesn't it? Oh, we can see this in all sorts of different ways we live our lives. One of the places we see is our entertainment choices. We love resolution. We dislike comfort. And therefore, the most popular movies out there right now are movies that involve heroes and villains. And guess what? In our favorite movies, who wins? The heroes, right? We love a good, happy, comfortable ending. We love resolution. Let me give a disclaimer as we talk about discomfort. I'm not asking you to tolerate any discussion or words that cause you actual harm. That's not what I'm talking about. We're all human beings created in God's image. In God's image. 
And we value protecting the image of God in each other. Oh, we value all people regardless of their race, their sexuality, their gender identity, of their religion. And that's why we've gone back again and again throughout this series to compassion and to grace. I do hope that we have difficult, uncomfortable conversations at Sycamore Creek. Starting in our worship service, this is what we're doing right now, but extending to our small groups and to our gatherings to do that hard work, being comfortable with discomfort. I listen to Sarah and Beth describing their hard conversations in an interview that they did with our lead pastor, Tom Arthur. Here's a piece of that interview. It always felt to me like church was afraid to touch controversial subjects. And I think that's part of why I had such a long hiatus from it because, um, and why I find such grace in the church now. I, I want the church to engage in really difficult subjects with me because what else is there? Um, especially in a year like this one, when we have a worldwide pandemic, we have a presidential election, we have such a fractured society. Um, you know, I think the, the biggest thing is being willing to go there and to accept that we're, we're not going to have ultimate authority coming from the church. The purpose of engaging in these conversations is not to be directive about policy outcomes or voting preferences. It is to say, how do we live our values through these places where we have some real disagreement about what our values counsel? In a grace-filled conversation, sometimes it means just letting that be letting it let, you know, acknowledging that it's hard, that it's going to be um, hard on those around us and hard on those in leadership and having a lot of self-compassion and a lot of empathy for everybody else, because what we're going through is difficult, um, but we're going through it together. And that, um, you know, there, there it's, yeah, I, I quote a league of their own in the book. I quote a lot. The hard is what makes it great. Hard is what makes it great. I love that sentiment. A difficult, uncomfortable things can be really helpful. As Sarah and Beth advocate in their book for us to consider accepting a greater level of discomfort politically, culturally, and even with our bodies. Now, let me give you tell you what, what I mean by that. I, I talk and post on social media a lot about hiking. But I have a confession. Sometimes, sometimes I don't feel like hiking. I do it anyway, though, as part of an exercise regimen for my health. And as a result, I've been able to push myself in ways that I never would have thought possible. It vastly improved my health. You see, regular exercise has helped me to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. I'm currently working, I've been working on physical therapy throughout the summer on this, and I'm currently working on flexibility, which is a new area for me. It's helping me again to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. You see, when we move our bodies into new positions, new positions that require flexibility or strength, we experience discomfort. But it's that discomfort that's actually good for us. It's that comfort, discomfort that creates healing and health in our bodies. Now, it's discomfort that facilitates flexibility and strength. Now, let me be clear, discomfort is much different from pain like we've clarified already. I mentioned discomfort today because it's not only important for our political discussions, it's not only important for our bodies, it's a part of our faith. As Sarah and Beth put it, being comfortable with discomfort is a release of control. So is faith. So is faith. Oh, we see this again and again and again in the Bible. Oh, we can go back to the story of Moses, a guy who had difficulty speaking, gets asked to go and speak to the Pharaoh, the leader of the Egyptian people. Uh, Gideon, a man was told to go into battle and fight with only 300 men at his side. Ruth, someone who's not a native-born Jewish person, leaves behind her people and goes with her mother-in-law and takes on the Jewish faith. Mary, Jesus' mom, finds out she's pregnant from an angel before she's married to Joseph. Peter. Peter steps out onto the water. Every single one of those stories are people who stepped out in faith in the midst of discomfort. 
It was not comfortable. You see, that's faith. That's faith when we release control. When we engage in uncomfortable, grace-filled conversations, that's an act of faith. That's God at work in and through us, and it strengthens our faith to do that. Now, how do we live that out? How do we live out these being comfortable with being uncomfortable, whatever that means? I think it's two words. It's, it's being kind. It's being kind. You see, the simplest way to be comfortable with discomfort is to start with kindness. To prioritize being kind over being right. Ooh, let me repeat that. That's good stuff. Prioritize being kind over being right. That's tough to do. One of the key verses that we started this series with is from Ephesians 4, verse 32, where Paul writes, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. To get comfortable being uncomfortable involves wading into difficult conversations with kindness as the goal. Huh. You'll find God's comfort in the midst of that type of discomfort, and you'll find that you will grow both into mature and complete followers of Christ. You know what will also happen? It'll move us toward real progress. Real progress. The first thing about conversations toward real progress is to get comfortable being uncomfortable and be kind in the midst of it. The second thing is to exit the echo chamber. To exit the echo chamber. And at the heart of this second step is being challenged. You see, without challenge, we don't grow and we don't develop. When I think about this, I think about a guy in the Bible named Zacchaeus. Luke, in Luke's gospel, uh, describes Zacchaeus this way in Luke 19, verse 2. There was a man named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he, he had become very rich. Two things to notice there. He's the chief tax collector and he had become very rich. Zacchaeus was someone who had aligned himself with the Roman government. And as a result, he had exploited his people and become very rich. And then you have Jesus, this prophetic outsider, not in any way an insider, not in any way powerful in the traditional political sense. Will these two guys engage? Now, will Jesus focus on people who are more like him? What does Jesus do? He says to Zacchaeus, I'm going to your house today. Jesus engages Zacchaeus. And what happens? Real progress. Now listen to where exiting the echo chamber and God's grace working through that leads. This is in verses 8 and 9 of Luke 19. Uh, meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half, half my wealth to the poor. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. Following Jesus' example is difficult for us to do. Particularly when it comes to politics. And there's a problem that we have with healthy political discussion. And that big problem is encapsulated in two words, the media, the media. Oh, the media. <laughs> we love to throw that phrase around, don't we, the media. Between print media, broadcast media, online media, social media, the media can seem like a lot. And we are more distrustful of the media than ever. We're more distrustful than ever. And I like how Sarah and Beth put it, though. They say it. The solution is not disengaging. It's learning how to engage with the news in a smart and thoughtful way. I like that. It's not disengaging. It's learning how to engage in a smart and thoughtful way. You see, on social media, there are algorithms, and those algorithms are designed to keep you in your bubble. The algorithms are designed to match content to you. And you, you know what that does? Well, the goal on social media is to entertain and engage you. It's not to challenge you. It's not to make you a better person. It's not to have real progress. You have to actively work 
if you're going to fight those algorithms that are designed to keep you in your sameness bubble. That's where we have the exit the echo chamber challenge that we've been talking about throughout this series. I want to walk you through that challenge. It's described in Sarah's best book, and it's also on their Pantsuit Politics blog. You'll see the address there on the screen. A day one of the challenge is to take a selfie explaining why you want to exit the echo chamber. So why would you want to do this? Why would you want to engage? What, what are your hopes and dreams for politics, for political discussion for our country? Take that selfie and commit to the challenge. Day two is to read three articles from news sources you don't usually read. Now, I'm going to put up on the screen here some, some different news organizations. And this is where, where these news organizations are thought to fall you know, toward the left or to the right or to the middle. And you see sort of in the middle you have the, the NPR, this is sort of middle left. You will see uh, the Wall Street Journal sort of middle to the right. And, and then from there you can go to the right or to the left. And, and I'd encourage you to look at that and then find some news source that you read that's different than what you would usually read. Now, don't go way far right if you're usually left. Don't go way far left if you're usually right. What happens if you go to the extremes is you don't listen at all. We tend to listen to things that are somewhat close to what we believe, and we change incrementally. We, we don't change in really big jumps. Now, Julie Galef, the co-founder of the Center for Applied Rationality, has the recommendation to engage in news sources that don't directly oppose your worldview and approach. Now she says that, well, why does she say that? Because if you seek out sources that directly oppose your thinking, you end up hardening your opinion instead of exploring those other options. So go a little in one direction or in the other. Don't go to extremes. Day three involves having a conversation with someone in real life who voted differently than you. Have that conversation with someone who voted differently with you, and then you're prepared for day four where you can send a letter Send a letter or an email to someone you disagreed with politically. A day five is to compliment the other side. Whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, what, what do you view as positives about the other side? I'll tell you, they're not all bad either side. There are things that are good about either side. Day six is to draw an empathy map. I have an empathy map up on the screen to help get you thinking of things about another political party. What this helps you to do is to get an appreciation for what motivates the other side, their hopes, their dreams, their fears. It's an incredibly powerful thing to put ourselves in someone else's shoes and to try to think like them. And finally, day seven is to take action, to live this out. It's to work on not being in your own echo chamber of sameness, but to have conversations with people that we disagree with. At its best, that's what we hope to have here at Sycamore Creek Church. We hope to have a collection of people who don't always agree politically, but who agree on the love of Jesus. I'd love it if our church wasn't an echo chamber. But it was a place where we were united in love of Jesus, where we have differing political views, and we challenge one another, and we discuss in love. The second step is to exit the echo chamber that moves us toward real progress, but the third step is to keep it nuanced. To keep it nuanced. If we look up nuance in the dictionary, uh, what we find is that nuance is a subtle distinction or variation. A subtle, a subtle distinction or variation. You see, when we keep it nuanced, we resist simple and black and white explanations. See, nuance requires effort. It's not easy. And that effort starts with having our heart in the right place. Listen to this Old Testament interaction between Jehu and Jehonadab. Now, when Jehu departed from there, he met Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. And he greeted him and said to him, Is your heart right? as my heart is right toward your heart? And Jehonadab answered, It is. Jehu said, If it is, give me your hand. 
So he gave him his hand, and he took him up to him in the chariot. That's from 2 Kings, and there's such an important question there. Is your heart right? If it's to win, if it's to dominate, if it's to be black and white, you're not going to keep it nuanced. You're not. You're also not going to have real progress in conversations will be all that much more difficult. We're not always going to recognize nuance. This is tough to do, and that's why it starts with our heart. It starts with slowing down and examining what's really there. We tend toward oversimplification and toward pattern recognition, and that's not always a good thing. Not that long ago, as reported in the Lansing State Journal, there's a, a bed and breakfast up in St. John's where the Norwegian flag has been prominently displayed. And people began complaining about that Norwegian flag. Let me show you what a Norwegian flag looks like. Because they thought that that Norwegian flag looked like a Confederate flag. It doesn't, does it? It doesn't look anything like a Confederate flag. But this is the problem when we do not have our heart in the right place. And this is a problem when we don't recognize nuance and subtle differences. It's easy to be offended. It's easy to assume the worst. Where's your heart? Do you see nuance? Now we need to treat nuance as a verb. It's a lifelong practice. See, the truth about nuance is that conflict sells, but conciliation creates progress. Let me repeat that. Conflict sells, but conciliation creates progress. If we want real progress, we need to have grace-filled political conversations. And that happens when we get comfortable being uncomfortable, when we're kind in the midst of that, when we exit the echo chamber, and when we keep it nuanced. As we wrap up this series today, I have some final goals for us for Grace-Filled Conversations, some final commitments for us to make. We've issued a lot of challenges throughout this series because this is challenging stuff. We've challenged you to pray at 8 at 8, for 8 minutes at 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., to pray for our country, to pay for our pol pol politics, our political discourse, to pray for our communities, to pray for our church. We've challenged you to exit the echo chamber. Here's a final list of us. For us of commitments. Commit to recognizing and putting down your defensiveness. Commit to recognizing and putting down your defensiveness. Commit to learning something in the discussion. Commit to having a dialogue where you don't just give alternate speeches back and forth, but where you really listen. Commit to assessing whether you're the right person to say what is on your mind. Ooh, that's a tough one. Are you the right person to speak truth to someone else? Sometimes the answer is no. And finally, commit to ending the discussion, ending the political discussion and knowing that you've strengthened the relationship. That's a grace-filled conversation. And that leads us back to what we started this series with is our, our quote from John Wesley. Where he says, though we cannot think alike, May we not love alike. May we not be of one heart, though we are not of one opinion. Without all doubt, we may. Here in all the children of God may unite, notwithstanding these smaller differences. This is difficult, but by God's grace, we can do it. And by God's grace, we can have our yard signs, we can have our political ads, and we can have grace-filled conversation. Amen. So how do we do this? You know, we've been talking about, um, for the course of this series, I'm talking about how we can get along with people who disagree with us politically, how we can um, love people with whom we disagree in the middle of... And the reality is we're talking about doing this in the middle of sort of a nationwide disagreement um, with real hostilities with people who are really truly angry with one another, who are hurting one another, who are expressing this through violence. 
um, how do we do that and how do we do that differently? Um, we've offered up some suggestions. Uh, we've talked about some things and I think those things have been helpful. But in, in a lot of ways, when it comes to loving one another, the, the best thing we can do is to really turn to God uh, to show us his love and to inspire us to do that, uh, to carry that love um, into our relationships with others. So uh, we're going to sing together about, about that and about our need for God to be the one to show us the way. few announcements for us this morning and the first announcement is that we would love to get connected with you we would also love it if you would take next steps in response to today's message uh, you can take next steps you can get connected by filling out a connection card at sycamorecreekchurch.org backslash connection if you do that for the first time we have a free gift that we'd like to send you it's a book by max lucado you'll get through this it's an incredibly powerful book it's a book about hope and we think everyone needs that right now. In the midst of political discussions, in the midst of whatever you might be going through in your life, we need the hope that comes from Jesus. And that's what Max Lucado writes about in I Think You're Wrong, but I'm listening. Fill out a connection card this morning. The second thing that we encourage you to do, this is part of how Sycamore Creek accomplishes this mission through connection, but also through growth. 
And one of the things that we do that helps each other grow is we get together in small groups. Worship is wonderful. Worship is fantastic. But where we really grow and where we really change is through relationships. And relationships are formed and strengthened through small groups. Now, this fall, we're going to be uh, starting in October, hitting our New Testament challenge. We're going to read through the New Testament together as a church. And our small groups are going to talk about it and hold one another accountable and support one another as we work our way through the New Testament. You'll want to be in a small group for this. I tell you, you join a small group, and I can almost guarantee you that if you read Scripture together and allow yourself to be open to the lives of others and how God works through that, it will change your life. Get into a small group. Go to sycamorecreekchurch.org backslash small groups to get into a small group. Now, as part of this series, we've talked about this many times now, we have two challenges for you. The first is the one I talked about today to exit the echo chamber. I encourage you to take that challenge. It's always one of our next steps throughout this series on your connection card. Another challenge that we have for you is to pray eight at eight, to pray for eight minutes at 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. for our country, for our church, uh, to be a people together who seek God through prayer. I want to encourage you to take that challenge. Now, as we accomplish the mission of Sycamore Creek to ignite authentic life of Christ and fan it into an all-consuming flame, we cannot do it without your support. Thank you so much for your generous giving that helps support the mission of God. You help to share God's love by giving to Sycamore Creek. There are a lot of different ways you can give to Sycamore Creek. One of the best right now throughout the pandemic is to give online. It's regular, it's consistent. You can do that by going to sycamorecreekchurch.org backslash give to help support the mission of Sycamore Creek. Now, speaking of the mission of Sycamore Creek, not that long ago, we had our second bread drop day of the late summer, early fall season, and it was an amazing day. We gave away over 4,400 pounds of bread and baked goods. That's right, 4,400 pounds. Uh, we had all sorts of stuff that we brought in from the truck. That's what you just saw in that video. We, we organized it all throughout our fellowship hall, which is what you see here. And then we went through and we filled boxes with bread and baked good products. This is just some of the sliced bread that you're seeing there in that picture. We put it into boxes for distribution. And by 3.30 in the afternoon, we'd given everything away. By 3.30 in the afternoon, we'd given everything away. Now, we gave away bread and baked goods. In addition, we gave away uh, bags of grapes. They were good. I sampled just to make sure. We gave away bags of apples. People were really excited to receive fresh apples. And we also gave away bags of potatoes. This is so much fun. Our bread drop is for anyone in our community who can use the food. Actually, anyone in any community who can use the food. Thank you, God, for the mission of Sycamore Creek. Thank you for your support of the mission of Sycamore Creek that allows us to reach people and to share God's love through food, through knowing that we care. Here is Kevin with our final worship songs. We're going to sing one last song together for our service today. This is uh, Fanny Crosby one, Blessed Assurance. This is my 
my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior. Savior, I'm happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. We have a connect question this week to conclude our service, something you can discuss uh, with those who are with you. You can discuss online, and it's this. What is your favorite comfort food? Um, so that's a good one. I don't know. I think it just you just sort of have to go, I think, pizza at that point. I don't know if there's anything that's that's really better than that when you just, when you just need a little something solid. Anyways, have a great week. Go in peace. <laughs>